My name is Mike DiPaolo. So I'm, both, I'm best known within the open source community for my roles on the X2Go project and the Fedora project. X2Go is a remote desktop solution, and I've, prim I've been contributing m multiple components there, uh, such as desktop environment integration. I've also been uh, the primary maintainer of the Windows client. Louder. I've also, on the X2Go product, I've, which is a remote desktop solution, I've, uh, the two biggest things I've done is desktop environment integration and uh, 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 maintaining the, the Windows client. Because although X2Go is a server for, the X2Go remote desktop server is only available for Linux, the clients are available for Windows, Linux, and Mac. Um, on the Fedora project, I've been a packager and an ambassador. Uh, this talk is based on my experience as a system administrator. Uh, which I've been doing for years, um, and recently have started using Ansible for. Um, there will be a demonstration of Ansible running about one third of the way through the presentation uh, with some of the code that's on screen then. And uh, the, ex the example code here is, I mean, some of it's not specific to any Linux distro. Much of it's uh, specific to Fedora or specific to CentOS 7 slash RHEL 7. Um, and I'll begin with the explanation of why uh, this presentation is needed. So. Uh, you know, Ansible is typically used to configure servers or an entire data center. For servers, the general term is configuration management. Um, but when you're, and typically in support of servers, you're trying to, you know, you have very different paradigms. Like users aren't going to physically interact with the computer by pressing the power button, for example. And uh, uh, you don't have, you're running, you're running a single application on, this, on the server, and the entire configuration of the server support that one application. And often there's developer desktops too are configured via Ansible, uh, but they're typically just in support of the application. Whereas you're managing a fleet of uh, Linux desktops, you have to worry about setting things like screen locks, a common security policy that only really applies to desktops, not to servers. You have to, have to worry about things like uh, uh, we recommended settings for users, you want to set them to help them, versus mandatory settings for users we have to set for them. And you'll be configuring very different parts of the OS too for the uh, desktops. And you know, these desktops often run like a hundred different applications. They, uh, if you just look at the start menu, you may see all the applications there. And as a system, you're often configuring settings for probably dozens of those applications in the start menu. Um, so I'll begin with an overview of Ansible for configuration management. Um, so whether you're configuring desktops or servers, like 20 years ago, and more like 10 years ago, if you were, con you were configuring parts of the OS, you were setting settings to config files, and maybe restarting services based on those settings you send config files. And the way you would do this is bash scripts. You would not just, s s in your bash scripts, well, it's, it's a general purpose programming language, and you would not just set, how do I set these settings, but also, so you're not just set what settings I want to set and when to set them, but also how to set them. So if you need a, if, if you run your bash script against a machine two times in a row, it might put the same value twice, and that could be a syntax error. So Ansible was developed as a better solution for system administrators, that, uh, where instead of writing in Bash, which is a full-featured, close to a full-featured programming language, you write in a simple domain-specific language. And my current job, we actually have technicians starting to write Ansible code because it's so much simpler in its uh, YAML syntax. And instead of uh, writing the writing uh, logic like, oh, add, set up this setting is set if not. If it's set to the wrong value modified, if it's not set at all, add it. Instead, you simply declare the, the settings that you want in those config files, like a name and a value, and ensures that the setting is already set. That's called declarative code. Um, the comp uh, as you're writing Ansible, you know, you're, essentially you're calling what's called modules. These modules are written in Python. They take care of, the, of how to set the settings you want to set for you. Um, I have examples here, like a specific one would be syscontrol or sysctl for kernel values, and a generic one would be line and file, and a kind of happy medium between those two would be something like ini file. Um, you, you call these modules as tasks, and the tasks uh, go into playbooks, and if you're, for the proper structure of your overall code base, those, those playbooks goes into roles. You can write your own roles, or you can use roles and write other people and just pass variables to them. Um, and Ansible is typically, uh, you, with Ansible, you have a management node, which is, could be on laptop or desktop, or it could be a, a Ansible Tower or AWX, or there's also a third party solution too, like that. Um, and then the, the managed systems are reached via SSH. There's no agent on the system. Um, so here's an example of a task. Um, 
uh, the task is calling the module called INI file. And this, this demonstrates the first topic that lots of OS components, especially desktop OS components, can be configured via the INI file module. Uh, does anybody uh, want to explain what this task does exactly? Okay, so one thing we discovered at work is that people, they, when they want to reboot their computer, they want to reboot it instantly. They're not willing to wait even for like disks to sync and if NFS is hanging, well the disks aren't going to sync quickly enough and they're just going to hold down the power button. So system D has a feature called the control alt delete first action, which is if you press control delete seven times in two seconds, it does a special action. Uh, by default, it's, the value is reboot as force, which still tries to flush to disks. And so a setting we often set is reboot immediate, which just, it's almost like an alternative to, press, to holding down the power button and pressing the power button again. Um, so as we're calling the INI file, it's, it's saying this is the, the, na the section of the file, this is the name called the option, this is the value, reboot immediate. And I often specify no extra spaces because most config files on the system uh, don't put extra spaces between the name and the value, although it's really, uh, it's typically superficial and they're ignored. Oh, there's another thing too, is typically in the, the Ansible tasks, I put the, 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 the task name would be like what I'm doing, but to make the example interesting, because this is a really annoying problem at work, I just listed why I'm doing it in the name, and typically why would be in a comment. So lots of uh, desktop OS components are configured via the INI, can be configured by the INI file module. Uh, GDM's uh, config file, which in a corporate environment, you often have lots of requirements for what the login screen should look like. Well, that's conf best configured with the INI file module. Uh, KD's config files are also INI file modules. And uh, GNOME, GNOME uses the DCOM framework to store settings. And typically in your home directory, it's stored in a binary database. But the system-wide settings that uh, the distro can provide and that, there's, uh, and that you as a system can set are set as uh, plain text files, which are INI files. So, I recommend using INI file module for these DCOM settings. Now there is an Ansible DCOM module, but that only modifies the currently uh, like running session. So if you're, if Ansible is man logged into a system as root, uh, it's not gonna see a running session. The, the DCOM module will fail. The DCOM module is only useful if you're modifying neutral user session. But as a system and you're typically saying, multiple people could be using this desktop, I wanna configure the setting for everybody on that desktop. So that's why I recommend I recommend using the INI file module, and we'll be doing that, showing that in a second. Um, so the this is a, a, a common example of a setting that you would want to set in an enterprise environment, which is to set the background of a computer. This is especially commonly desired in an educational environment, and I'll explain why in a second. Um, so what it's, what it's doing here, it's saying, um, you know, there's an INI file, at, I'm specifying the path to it on, on disk of the managed system, and you know, the section name, which is sort of like a folder, is a GNOME desktop background. The exact option is picture URI, and the value is a file on disk. And now you may notice at the end there that I have a, 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 a handler to generate the DHOP database. You do need this when you're modifying uh, the system, uh, system-wide DCOM settings. Because it's, although DCOM, Although you're supposed to have, although you're supposed to write all your settings as the INI files modules initially, it needs to be joined to a database so that all the user sessions will actually read them. And all you have to do is just run the command dconf update, and technically the command module would be better than running the shell module, although the shell module I've been doing at my current job for this. Um, and I have a simple check to see if it failed to generate the dconf database. Um, now here's the funny part is, in an educational environment, the, the background and the screensaver is often very important to set mandatory. Otherwise, people will s set their background or screensaver to text that's not appropriate, especially like the principal sucks. So but this actually was a problem at my, uh, my first internship I did at my own high school where they loved the fact that Microsoft admitted group policy in Windows 2000 and therefore they could set mandatory background and mandatory screensavers. Before they had the ability to set mandatory settings via Windows mechanism, they had that problem all the time. So what this does here is it says, uh, uh, no, using, uh, you know, here's a, a, a dconf plain text file and 
this says that the setting we set in the other file is mandatory. It's user, users cannot modify it. Um, and it calls the same handler. So at this point, I'm going to demonstrate the uh, demonstrate that task. There's two tasks running. Oh, whoops, I need to do this on the. <coughs> Sorry, that's. Here's a simple Ansible playbook. It has the uh, some skeleton uh, lines, like saying elevate to boot, become, and there's the two tasks that it showed you along with the handler. So Ansible playbook. I'm sorry. Oh yeah, certainly. Certainly. Yep. So there's the skeleton code up there, and then there's the, the, the two tasks in the handler I just showed you. So I'm Ansible, I'm going to tell it to run the playbook, and say to uh, prompt for my password, and I'm going to run it against my own uh, laptop right now. Tracing purposes and I'll maximize this. And there you go. Because dconf uh, the background is set. Because and it's the Ansible logo. Because uh, dconf uh, runs as, as a daemon that runs at, at, under the user session and that daemons configured to look at both the system database for mandatory settings as well as in default settings and listen to your own settings in your own home directory. The fact that we updated the system database means DCOMP was immediately aware of it and uh, uh, applied the change to the running session. Let me get my slides back up. Okay, now I'm going to, uh, this third example is setting some similar settings under uh, KD. Instead of doing the uh, entire, the background would similarly be a single setting, but I, I, one setting you often, often have to set for free of desktops is the screensaver settings. So many corporations have requirements like, oh, you must lock the screen after 10 minutes or after 20 minutes. This example locks the screen after 20 minutes. It brings up the, uh, the screen screens after 10 minutes and then applies the locked uh, 10 minutes later. Um, and just like before, I'm doing the INI file module. There, you know, KD does have these exact same config files under your home directory, and you're welcome to generate them under your home directory and then copy them to the system-wide location. Um, and uh, do you note in these, what I'm doing here is I'm saying, you know, this is a file, and these are the name and value pairs, and that's, um, but in the name, I have the bracket a dollar sign I. Uh, that it says immutable. It's basically a way of saying this is a mandatory setting. You're not simply saying the default setting for your users, you're saying it to be a mandatory setting. I would, I would point out an interesting piece of experience that often users will try, ha users hate the screen savers and the screen lock, well, not the screen saver, but the screen lock so much, and they'll often look for ways to defeat it. They'll often look for third party apps to jiggle the mouse, for example, and simulate uh, mouse input, EX11. I'm hoping Wayland will address this, but in the meantime, this one, you will often have to. You, you may find that like 5% of users are finding ways to defeat this and you have to look for organizational ways of telling them to stop trying to defeat the screen lock policy or look into ways of killing those processes that would defeat it. Um, so another, another uh, desktop sort of difference is, so on servers, you know, if you're defining who can call these elevated, uh, who can run privilege commands, you're going to do it via sudo. And sudo has its own well-known syntax. But uh, graphical apps try not to use sudo or anything like 
because sudo runs the entire program, the entire binary uh, in GUI as, uh, as root. So what many graphical apps do nowadays is they have the, the main graphical, the, the GUI binary, the main binary running as the user account, and they call special helper binaries uh, to do the specific actions as, as root. Um, the, the best example of this is GNOME software. And the way you configure policies for who can install software is, or who can update software that's already installed is done via policy kit. Um, the best way to configure a policy kit is just to uh, copy the, the copy the config files from you know that you want inst inst you want to install the config files as static or generate the config files according to templates. There's no uh, specific like module for configuring them right now, like INI file or dconf. Um, in this specific example, I'm co I'm copying some policy kit files to handle the fact that if your users are accessing their desktop remotely, like over Tiger VNC or X2Go, that they'll receive prompts on login. Uh, these prompts, the default policy config is, oh, if you're logged in, if you're logged in uh, locally, you can modify the caller schema. If you're logged in remotely, you have to you need administrator uh, credentials to modify the caller schema. And if the users don't go to modify the caller schema, they still receive the uh, a prompt at login to I need privileges to modify the color schema. So here I'm just, uh, this is an example of me just copying some policy kit files, uh, rules files to replace the system wide rules under user, user system default rules less USR so that users can modify the color schema and they don't receive the prompt to do that. Um, so no, another big difference between uh, desktops and servers is, you know, I said users will often run like a hundred different applications. If you have a, if you have a large enough set of users and therefore a large enough set of applications you desire, there could basically be about a hundred of them. Uh, so as opposed to servers where the server is supposed to run only one application. So uh, the, the, the section of my talk is about tips and tricks for speeding up how you install all those packages um, and ma maintainably installing all those large packages also. If you're on RHEL 7 or CentOS 7, I strongly suggest that you install YUM4, uh, which is the compatibility name for basically for DNF. Um, if you, call, you can then install packages with a YUM module and it'll call the YUM4 DNF under the hood when present. If you really want to use the legacy YUM, you could still just, uh, that's just an option to the YUM module now in Ansible. This is as of like the latest version of Ansible that they made this change of uh, YUM actually calling YUM4 DNF. Um, and the, the reason why DNF is so much faster, well, lots of people know that DNF is faster than YUM at installing packages to begin with, like, it, like evaluating dependencies, for example. This is true, but there's a more important reason why you want to use DNF with Ansible, which is that Ansible doesn't trust uh, YUM to check whether a package is installed and only install it if it's not installed. So instead, the, the YUM module consults the RPM database, I think it calls libRPM or something, to see if the package is installed, and then tell Yum to install the ones that are not installed. Uh, this results, this se severely slows down how long it takes to install packages. It basically makes it take about twice as long. Uh, so when you're using DNF, it's calling DNF stable API, and that's, and therefore you have basically almost no overhead. It's the Ansible DNF module works about as fast as the Ansible, as DNF on the command line does. So, Another tr tr trick for installing a large number of packages is to use the package groups. Uh, these are, you know, the distro developers have decided that, you know, these are the packages that should be, in, that if somebody wants GNOME, they set have this complete set of packages, and that's the workstation product environment. And if they want KDE, they want this complete set of packages, and that's the KDE desktop environment. Um, if, you, if you want a specific group of, like, commonly requested applications, like if, uh, text editors, well, install the editors group, or, the, or if you want Ansible, install the Ansible node group, because they might install things like Ansible doc, for example, or some Ansible uh, like test tools. Um, this will speed up, this, this is, one reason why this is simply to speed up the provision time and simplify the amount of code that you specify in Ansible playbooks. The other reason too is that, you know, like it's said in soft engineering that pre premature optimization is the root of all evil. Well, if you have a tightly controlled desktop environment with countless systems running a small number of apps, you can slim down the number of packages you install aggressively. But if you try to slim down packages without making sure it's safe to slim down the number of packages you install, you will notice you will run into the issue of undeclared dependencies. A simple example of undeclared dependencies is fonts. Like 
this application looks best with this, this, this one font, but it's not installed, so we switch to using another one. And in general, like, you know, Fedora and RHEL and CentOS are going get, to get better at handling undeclared dependencies because there's now weak dependencies, but you will see lots of weird behaviors if certain, if certain uh, 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 common desktop dependencies are not installed. Uh, an example, uh, one of our uh, on a remote system running another Linux distro, like certain graph graphs are running, but then they're like the, the contents of like their public dialogues were not rendered because some undeclared dependency was not installed. It was very frustrating to have to debug that and get the organization to install that one undeclared dependency. But if, you had if they had just installed the entire KD or known package group, that undeclared dependency probably would have been installed. And just to clarify, so you have to use special syntax in, these, in the Ansible uh, YAM or DNF module for uh, uh, package groups versus uh, environment groups versus regular package groups. Um, this is the same as if you had installed on the command line with like DNF install rather than DNF group install. Um, another uh, tip that I have too is um, say you have a, a, like a list of about 100 patches you want to install. Um, there's uh, Ansible, you could keep that list of packages, or maybe it's been a thousand packages if you, depending on uh, the organization. So you may have that, those packages, you could put them all as in, 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 in a giant list in your YAML file. Um, what many people want to keep in an external source, like a, like a CSV file or a text file with comments. So uh, what I've been doing is I've been put, putting the list of packages to install in a text file with comments, and I've just, uh, I'm using an Ansible lookup plugin to call a command. And what the command does, it just uh, strips out all those comments. So this, this Yamlock, this task will just install a list of files from that, one, from that text file, one line for line. Sorry, each line is different package name. But there's other very good lookup plugins too, like, CS, uh, like I think this one's to use spreadsheets and like actual sources of, data, of information over the network. Um, Okay, so, uh, so sixth topic is a package could offline update. So package could offline updates are a mechanism for installing packages at, at the time the system is rebooted rather than while the system is running. This was developed based on some painful experiences that like Fedora developers experienced. I think the example they had was that if you update the Mozilla Firefox or Flash plugin package while those are running, uh, Firefox or Flash like refuse to work with each other until they're restarted. So, uh, there's other examples of packages you don't want to update it while the system's running too, like the proprietary NVIDIA driver, which is commonly distributed as RPMs for third parties. Well, they, the NVIDIA kernel module says, oh, user space has been updated, but you haven't rebooted the new kernel yet. I'm going to refuse to do any 3D acceleration. If it refuses to do 3D acceleration, it won't even launch GNOME shell. So, uh, therefore, the, what I've been doing is I've been updating these, any packages that are disruptive to update while the system is running via package could offline updates. And package often Package could offline update to, is in RHEL 7 now. Um, so first you would do is I would just yum update all the packages that are safe to update while the system is running. Um, and I would just apply a filter uh, by package name or by just uh, of the packages I don't want to update or I just disable those third party repos that have those uh, packages. And then I call, first I call a package kit offline update, package kit offline update command to just download the package, put them in the slash bar. And I have to wrap around the, you know, the, the return codes of the, of the command I'm calling. And it's basically, you know, you know, like zero means successfully downloaded them. Five means I have nothing more to do because it's already downloaded. And I put a comment there explaining what that five code return code exactly means. And then you have to, after this, you would call another Ansible task to uh, trigger the offline update so that it actually will apply the offline update at reboot and that minimal uh, systemd boot environment for installing the updates. And the idea is that you basically tell users, you must, you know, we've applied the updates to your system. To finish applying the updates, you must reboot by this date, like the end of the month or two weeks from now. And so if they don't reboot, we still reboot the workstation system anyway, but uh, at least this way, we don't have to worry about their, oh, <laughs> many apps refusing to launch because 3D acceleration isn't working though. And this is, as you can see, the logic here is pretty lengthy and it's kind of messy to wrap around all these. This is, I started working on an Ansible module for package kit offline updates, but I have not completed it yet. I'm just dealing with nuances of the Dbus API for package kit offline updates. Um, 
Another difference between desktop and servers is how you handle firm updates. With servers, typically the server vendor has a, base, a BMC, a baseboard management controller, like a Dell iDRAC or HP ILO integrated lights out. And these are special like single board computers or chips on the motherboard that enable you to, they enable systems to do a lot of things like oh, reboot the computer if the OS is not responding and monitor its fan and temperature speeds. And they often have their firm update features also. And firm updates often necessary because of the security updates on them too. Uh, so typically you would call the BMC command or APIs or whatever to update the firmware on a server. But on desktops for years, there was never a good way of applying the, the firmware updates uh, to them because they didn't have the BMCs. And so fortunately, uh, uh, people, with, people in the overall Linux community have been working hard on a mechanism to update the firmware from, from, the, from the Linux OS. And it's basically the same UEFI feature that Windows uses called UEFI firmware capsule updates. Um, that's, uh, the, uh, the, the commands for, for this are, uh, the tools for this are FWAPD, F-W-U-P-D, and the websites that, that hosts all, this, all the firmware updates uploaded by the uh, system vendors themselves is called LVFS, Linux Vendor Firmware, Service, Linux Vendor firmware Services. Um, uh, right. So uh, the two biggest system vendors that are, on, that are uploading their firmware to LVFS that can be applied this way are uh, Dell and Lenovo. Um, it's basically any three or four year old laptop or desktop or newer will support LVFS. So this is something I'd also like to develop a module for, but calling the, the, the commands uh, is, works pretty well. It's not, it would be a bunch of logic, like if you want to, but I'm just going to show you the commands you would wrap with Ansible right now. It's, you just call it firmware update manager install. Well, if you want to, if you want to just get the latest version, get it from LVFS directly, just do, call that simple command on the bottom, install latest version. Um, if you want to control the version that you want to install in your workstations, like say Dell just released a new update, but you want to test it yet because you always have to test the updates before you update a thousand users. Well, then you would, uh, I recommend you specify it as Ansible uh, defaults, which are like variables saying, this is the version I want, here's the URL for it, um, and do that for this model. If the model, if the desktop model is such and such, which is an Ansible fact of the, of the computer model, then install this version from this file. That's, that's the end of my presentation. Any questions? Yes? Yeah, I know. Okay, so I mean, yeah. So, yes. Yeah, so, so he said at his organization they have a fleet of servers and they have an Ansible code defining their configuration. They want to manage laptops also. However, the, if the servers are powered off for more than twenty-four hours, it's assumed that they may be too far out of date for the new current Ansible logic to successfully apply to it. Uh, so for servers, 24 hours is a pretty reasonable cutoff, but for laptops, well, they might be offline for weeks or even a month because uh, people take them home and just power them off. Um, 
So, you know, at my current work, workplace, we're, imp we're implying a high standard of like, you know, the Ansible code you write must, you know, we've, well, first of all, we have like basically patching appointments with users every single month. And they have to be there for the patching appointment. And that's true for Windows and Mac as well as Linux. We don't have Linux laptops yet. That's something I want to work on. But the idea is we would have something like, you know, the, the state must be, the, uh, we typically support up to replacing the old system configuration, updating the old logic on the system uh, and for about like two or three months. Like, you know, say we, say we, uh, we add it, we no, lo we no longer install this one config file on the system. We want it to be the system default version of that config file. We'd leave that interchangeable code base for two or three months. That way, we give us the chances of some system being too far behind that we have to reprovision re it with the current Ansible logic is very much minimized. Um, does that answer your question? And uh, there are tips and tricks. Also, there are lots of tricks on how to like use the same Ansible task for uh, both configuration updates as well as new provisions with that configuration. Uh, there is a talk at Ansible Fest about how to do that, and like. You know, you can use, you can use like, you can differentiate update versus provision with tags. And if you write proper like a impotent code and like clean up tasks, then that's, you know, it should be able to, you know, handle that well enough. It's just more work. So does that answer your question well enough? Any other questions? So yeah, I'm saying that any return code other than zero or five is an error return code. Not just, um, now th there is a better Ansible syntax that could basically say if download the RC is not in the list of zero or five. I should have just done that, but I just. I'm sorry. Sorry, let's wait for the door to close and I'll ask you to repeat that. I'm sorry, I'm still not understanding what you're saying. If the return code is zero, yes. then the first check will fail. Okay? It's, it's not five, so it will fail. Okay? I think this it will fail in any, any instance. Zero, one, two, three, four, five. It will fail in all cases. So this is an, 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 it might be a bug in my code, that's true, but I thought this, this is an and. It only fails when uh, both of those conditions. Yeah, sorry. Like, so I, there's the problem. All right, so there probably is a bug in my code. I, I was not. I didn't copy my exact code that I'm using in my current job, and so I tried to recreate it at home, and I was doing it pretty quickly. But the point is, the two acceptable return. And typically, I would do like a list, like when the RC is, it's, it fails when the, the RC is not list of zero or five, and there is a syntax for doing an Ansible. Other questions? Okay, I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you.